Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Our Father in heaven, what a wonderful privilege it is to be in your house of worship on your holy Sabbath. We ask, Father, that as we open your word, that your spirit will be in this place. Give us clear minds and tender hearts to understand and to receive your word. And we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. I want to invite you to open your Bibles with me to the second book of Timothy. The second book of Timothy. And our study today will be from chapter 4 and verses 1 through 5. Now before we get, read these verses, I would like to say something about the pastoral epistles. Basically, the pastoral epistles are 1st and 2nd Timothy and also the book of Titus. Now, they're called the pastoral epistles because they were written to two particular pastors in the early church. One of them, of course, was Timothy, and the other was Titus. Now, you're probably wondering why Pastor Bohr would preach a sermon based on books that were written to preachers. You might say, well, Pastor Bohr, those books were written for you. They were not written for the congregation. Why would you preach about two books where the Apostle Paul is giving his counsel to pastors? Well, there are actually two reasons why. Number one, I want you to understand today the reason why I preach as I do. Actually, there are some people who think that my preaching is a bit strong, and they're probably right. But we're going to notice in our study today the reason why this is the case. The Apostle Paul had some very definite counsel that he gave to Timothy about what his preaching should involve. And I believe that I need to accept and receive that counsel. Secondly, even though these books were written to uh, these two pastors, the book of Second Timothy also explains some things about the reaction of people to the message of the preachers. In other words, not only do the books speak about how preachers should preach, but the books actually address how people respond to the messages of the preachers. Now, before we read this passage, I need to tell you a few more things about the pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy and Titus. These books really are a church administration manual. Basically, they deal with the governance of the local church life. You see, the Apostle Paul had established churches all over the Roman Empire. He had organized churches according to the gospel order. In other words, he had established leaders such as bishops, deacons, and elders. And because the church had been organized, it was necessary to have a manual to govern the church, to describe the duties of each of these officers of the church, and to teach them what they needed to do to administrate the church. So really, First and Second Timothy and Titus are books that deal with the administration of the local church. Now, when the Apostle Paul wrote these letters to Timothy and to Titus, he was in his second imprisonment in Rome. In fact, he was about to be beheaded by the emperor Nero. And as he was there in prison awaiting execution, the Apostle Paul felt a great urgency concerning certain heresies and teachings that were beginning to creep into the Christian church. In fact, in these epistles we find a somewhat different tone than in the other writings of the Apostle Paul. In these epistles, First and Second Timothy and Titus, the Apostle Paul uses certain very key expressions, such as, for example, he speaks of the importance of the truth. He speaks about 
the faith, not having faith, but the faith, the content of the faith. He uses the expression sound doctrine very frequently in these letters. It becomes very clear that the Apostle Paul is concerned about doctrinal orthodoxy. He's concerned about what is being taught in the Christian church. He's interested in the preservation of sound doctrine. Because he's in prison, he's about to die, he sees heresy creeping into the church. In fact, he speaks about wolves coming in among uh, the flock and not sparing the flock. And so the Apostle Paul now speaks about the importance of the faith, the truth, and sound doctrine. Now, I want to read the passage that we're going to study, particularly this morning. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verses 1 through 5. Remember that here the Apostle Paul is speaking to a preacher, speaking to Timothy. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Now this is the passage that we're going to look at, particularly in our study today. And basically what we're going to do is go phrase by phrase and try and determine the meaning of each phrase to find out why the Apostle Paul is giving this counsel to Timothy as Paul is sitting in prison in Rome. You notice first of all that the passage begins by saying, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Now that expression, I charge you, originally in Greek, meant to take an oath in a court of law. And for a legal proceeding to be valid, you had to have at least two witnesses in the proceeding. What the Apostle Paul is saying is, I am now giving an oath before the two witnesses, the Father and Jesus Christ, his Son. In other words, I'm taking an oath in a court of law, I'm solemnly witnessing before God that, Timothy, you are to preach the Word of God. In other words, this introductory formula makes this very, very serious. The Apostle Paul is giving this counsel under oath in the presence of Jesus Christ, in the presence of God the Father. It must be extremely important. And the Apostle Paul is saying, the reason why I'm taking this oath before Jesus and his Father is because I am going to be judged when Jesus comes, and you are going to be judged when Jesus comes. Now notice that the passage continues saying to Timothy, preach the word. Now the question immediately comes up, which word was the Apostle Paul talking about? Well, if you look at the previous verses in the immediately preceding chapter, you're going to notice that the Apostle Paul commends Timothy because he has studied the Holy Scriptures since the time that he was a child. And then the Apostle Paul goes on to say that every Scripture is inspired by God. So the scriptures that the Apostle Paul is speaking about in context are the holy scriptures. In other words, the Bible, if you please. The written, holy, inspired word of God. So the Apostle Paul says to Timothy, preach the word. And then he says, be ready. What does that mean, be ready? It simply means be ready at any moment, to preach the Word. In fact, the next expression is, be ready in season 
and out of season. That means with advance notice and with no advance notice. In other words, you should always have sermons in your Bible, so to speak, so that you can preach if you're asked to do so. Not only when you're told in advance, but on the spurt of the moment. In other words, you should be ready to preach the Word of God at all times. Now, it's important to notice that in this passage, there are nine imperatives. Now, you probably know what imperatives are. Imperatives are a command. They are an order. Here the Apostle Paul isn't saying, you know, it would be nice if you could preach the Word. It would be nice if you're ready to preach in season and out of season, when it's convenient, when it's inconvenient. The Apostle Paul isn't saying that. These are imperatives. He's giving Timothy a command. He's saying, be ready to preach when it's convenient and inconvenient, in season, out of season, on the spur of the moment, and with advance notice. In other words, this is an order from God. Now the question is, what is Timothy supposed to preach out of the Word of God? How is he supposed to employ the Word of God in his preaching? Well, you find additional imperatives. The first word which is used is... Be ready to preach the Word of God in season and out of season. And then it says, convince. I'm using the New King James Version. Convince. Now that word convince means to convict of error because you have sufficient proof. To convince someone of their error because you have sufficient proof. Allow me to give you two or three texts which use this same word. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 20. The Apostle Paul uses this word in saying, Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest may fear. The translation here is rebuke. In other words, individuals are sinning, and these individuals who are sinning need to be convinced of their error. Also, in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11, the Apostle Paul says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. See there, the word expose is the same word. It is to convict of error because you have sufficient proof. And then, of course, you have Luke chapter 3 and verse 19, where John the Baptist rebuked Herod for marrying his brother's wife. So basically... The Apostle Paul is saying that the preacher is supposed to convict of error because the preacher has sufficient proof that that's what needs to happen. And then we have another imperative. Convince is the first one. Rebuke is the next one. Now what does rebuke mean? In the Greek language in which the New Testament was written, rebuke means to warn in order to prevent an action or in order to bring an action to an end. To prevent an action or to bring an action to an end. Perhaps several texts from the New Testament will help us understand the meaning of this word. For example, in Matthew 8 verse 26, we're told that the Lord Jesus rebuked the winds when the storm was on the lake. In other words, he was trying to get the winds to stop blowing. Stop their wrong behavior, if you please. Then you have, for example, Matthew chapter 8 and verse 26, where the disciples rebuke the children and try to keep them from coming to Jesus. You also have Matthew chapter 19 and verse 1, where, uh, where you have a similar use of this word. Basically, it means to warn in order to prevent an action or bring an action to an end. In this case, it would be to prevent a wrong action or to bring a wrong action to an end. Now, this isn't a pleasant job, but it needs to be done. The Apostle Paul is saying you must convict, you must rebuke. And then, of course, he uses another imperative, which is to exhort. Now, this is a positive word. It's the same word that is used to speak about the Holy Spirit. We speak of the Holy Spirit as the paraclete. We speak of the Holy Spirit as he who is called alongside someone, the helper, 
if you please. This word exhort means to call someone to your side to help you. For example, in Titus chapter 1 and verse 9, Paul tells the elders that they are to encourage the members. They are to help the members. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, the members of the church are told to encourage one another. So in other words, the work of preaching, according to the Apostle Paul, does not only involve convicting of error, does not involve only rebuking wrong behavior to bring it to an end or to prevent wrong behavior, but it also involves encouraging the church, encouraging those who are listening to the preaching. Then the Apostle Paul continues saying here in chapter 4, that this is to be done with all long suffering. In other words, the preaching needs to be done with patience. The word long suffering simply means patience. We don't use the word long suffering very much anymore. It means that the preacher is supposed to convict, he's supposed to rebuke, he's supposed to exhort or help with long suffering, in other words, with patience, because sometimes the preaching does not produce immediate fruits. Now, what is he supposed to exhort people with? How is he supposed to perform this task? Well, the fact is, the passage continues saying, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Now, this word teaching does not refer to the content of the teaching. It refers to the act of teaching. In other words, it refers to teaching as an activity. In other words, the preacher is really supposed to be what? The preacher is supposed to be a teacher. Because he's supposed to rebuke, he's supposed to help, he's supposed to convict with teaching according to this. In other words, preaching should be teaching. What the Apostle Paul is saying is that an individual who is called to the gospel ministry needs to be a patient or long-suffering teacher. Now, immediately we ask the question, why is it necessary for a preacher to exhort? Why is it necessary for a preacher to convict? Why is it necessary for a preacher to help or to... Uh, come alongside, alongside someone to encourage them. Why is this? Notice the passage continues saying, and here we reach the most important part of our study today, for the time will come. There's a time that's going to come. Now what does this mean? For the time will come. The time will come when what? Well, let's continue reading. The time will come when they... I wonder who are the they that are referred to here by the Apostle Paul. The time is coming when they... You know, if you read the pastoral epistles, we don't have time now to read all of the verses. But in the pastoral epistles, the Apostle Paul is speaking to members of the church. I mentioned that this is a church discipline manual. This is a church organization manual. So when the Apostle Paul says, when they, the time will come when they, he's not referring to Gentiles, he's not referring to pagans, he's referring to people who profess the name of Jesus. The time is coming when they, when they will not, will not what? Notice, when they will not endure what? Sound doctrine. That word endure means that they will not tolerate. They will not put up with sound doctrine. Why does the Apostle Paul tell Timothy that he's supposed to preach this way? Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convict. Rebuke. Exhort. These are all imperatives. It's Paul's counsel to the preacher. And then he says, the reason for this is because the time is coming when those who profess the name of Jesus will not tolerate or they will not put up with sound doctrine. 
Now the Apostle Paul is not talking about teaching as a method. The Apostle Paul is speaking about the content of the preaching. In other words, when he speaks about doctrine, he's talking about the doctrines as we understand them in the Adventist church. We have 28 fundamental beliefs, 28 fundamental doctrines. The Apostle Paul is talking about the doctrinal content of the Scriptures. He's saying that within the church the time is coming when those who are in the church will not tolerate sound doctrine. By the way, the word sound here is used elsewhere in the New Testament uh, to refer to someone who is healthy, physically healthy. It has, it's a word that has to do with health. In other words, they will not endure healthy doctrine. They will want doctrines, we're going to notice, that make people spiritually sick rather than spiritually well. Now, what was the Apostle Paul talking about when he said that they would not endure sound doctrine? Allow me to read you from 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9 a list of things that the Apostle Paul talks about as referring to doctrine which is not healthy, which is not good. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and we'll, beginning, we'll begin reading uh, at verse 9. The Apostle Paul says this, Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers. And if there is any other thing that is what? Contrary to sound doctrine. So if people are not accepting sound doctrine, it must be that they must be categorized in this list. Are you following me or not? And the interesting thing is that the Apostle Paul is not speaking to individuals who are outside the covenant community. The Apostle Paul is speaking to people who belong to the church. You say, how is it possible that you could say that all of this list of, of sins that are mentioned here could characterize what is happening in the Christian church? Well, the Apostle Paul says that this is sound doctrine if you reject these things in the behavior of your life. So they're going to reject sound doctrine. The Apostle Paul says, preach it. He doesn't say, well, because they're going to reject sound doctrine, uh, just uh, be politically correct. You know, don't tell it like it is. Just be smooth and soft. Don't offend anybody. That's not what he says. He says, preach the word. Tell it like it is. Now, what are these people going to want to do? He says that they will not endure sound doctrine. So what will they do then instead? But rather, after their own what? After their own lusts, they will pile up teachers. Now, in a moment, we're going to talk about piling up teachers. But after their own lusts, I want to talk a little bit about that expression. The word lusts in Greek is the word epithumia. It can be used in a negative sense a neutral sense, and a positive sense. You know, I can give you a couple of examples of, a, of the word being used in a pos positive sense. Basically, it means desires. For example, 1 Thessalonians 2.17, the Apostle Paul says that he desires to see the faces of the, of the Thessalonians. He desires. See, there it's, it's positive. Nothing bad. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 23, the Apostle Paul says that, that he desires, he has a burning desire to depart and to be with Jesus. See, there it's positive, the, the desire that is spoken about. But in most cases in the New Testament, the Greek word epithumia means something negative. It means wicked, evil passions that are found inside the heart which are manifested in evil actions. Let me give you some examples. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 24, the Apostle Paul says that those who have received Christ have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. See, it's the lusts of the flesh. 1 Timothy 6 verses 9 and 10, the Apostle Paul speaks about the rich who fall into many hurtful lusts. There it's used in a negative sense. 2 Timothy 2 verse 22, the Apostle Paul speaks to, to youth 
In fact, he speaks about youthful lusts in the area of sexual relations. In Romans 13, verse 14, the Apostle Paul speaks about making no provision to fulfill the lusts of the flesh. In Romans 6, and verse 12, the Apostle Paul says, Do not allow sin to reign in your mortal bodies to obey the lusts thereof. And then you have Second uh, Peter chapter 3 and verse 3 where the Apostle Peter tells us that in the last days people will walk according to their own lusts. So basically, the word lusts here refers to evil desires, sinful desires that are found in the heart which express themselves in evil actions. And so the Apostle Paul is saying that the time is coming when many in the church will not tolerate sound doctrine, but rather according to their own sinful, lustful, evil desires, they are going to do something. They are going to pile up teachers. Now, before I talk about piling up teachers, let me ask, you're probably wondering, how is it possible, Pastor Bohr, that this could be a description of things that are happening within the Christian church? The fact is, folks, if we're honest with ourselves, Christians today watch what the world watches. They listen to what the world listens to. They participate in the entertainment that the world participates in. They dress as the world dresses. They eat and drink as the world eats and drinks. They lie and they cheat as the world does. They divorce and get married again multiple times as happens in the world. You know that I'm saying the truth. And it's happening within the Christian church. So you're saying, Pastor Moore, you're saying that, that these individuals within the Christian church who are being, uh, who are the recipients of the message of the preacher are actually going to want to live according to their sinful lusts. Absolutely, but it's worse than that. You see, not only does the Apostle Paul say that people within the church are going to want to live according to their sinful lusts, he says that they are actually going to try and justify what they're doing. And this is where we come to the next portion of the passage. The Apostle Paul says, they will heap up the New International Version translates it, they will gather around them a great number of teachers. Now, you'll notice in the New King James it says, they will heap up for themselves. This is a reflexive pronoun, which means that the teachers are not coming and imposing their will upon the church. It's really the, really the church itself which is deciding to pile up the teachers. They are piling up the teachers for themselves. In other words, the church wants these teachers to be in their midst. In other words, the teachers are not responsible. Those who are heaping up the teachers are responsible. Allow me to read you a few statements from the Spirit of Prophecy on how Ellen White saw the condition of the church in her day and age. What would she say today? Great Controversy 5.23, she says, Those who are unwilling to accept the plain cutting truths of the Bible are continually seeking for pleasing fables that will quiet the conscience. The less spiritual, self-denying and humility, humiliating the doctrines presented, the greater the favor with which they are received. These persons degrade the intellectual powers to serve their carnal desires. Early writings, page 273. She's writing back in the 1840s, what I'm going to read now. She says, I saw that since the second angel proclaimed the fall of the churches, they have been growing more and more corrupt. They bear the name of being Christ's followers. Yet it is impossible to distinguish them from the world. Ministers take their text from the Word of God, but preach smooth things. To this the natural heart feels no objection. It is only the spirit and power of the truth and the salvation of Christ that are hateful to the carnal heart. 
There is nothing in the popular ministry that stirs the wrath of Satan, makes the sinner tremble, or applies to the heart and conscience the fearful realities of a judgment soon to come. Wicked men are generally pleased with a form of piety without true godliness, and they will aid and support such a religion. In another statement, which we find in early writings 227 and 28, this, this is a sobering statement. The Lord's servant says this, I saw a very large company professing the name of Christ, but God did not recognize them as His. He had no pleasure in them. Satan seemed to assume a religious character and was very willing that the people should think they were Christians. He was even anxious that they should believe in Jesus, His crucifixion, and His resurrection. Satan and his angels fully believe all this themselves and tremble. But if this faith does not provoke to good works and lead those who profess it to imitate the self-denying life of Christ, Satan is not disturbed, for they merely assume the Christian name while their hearts are still carnal. And he can use them in his service even better than if they made no profession. Hiding their deformity under the name of Christian, they pass along with their unsanctified natures and their evil passions unsubdued. This gives occasion for the unbeliever to reproach Christ with their imperfections and causes those who do possess pure and undefiled religion to be brought into disrepute. Now she speaks about ministers. She says the ministers preach smooth things to suit carnal professors. They dare not preach Jesus and the cutting truths of the Bible, for if they should, these carnal professors would not remain in the church. But as many of them are wealthy, they must be retained, although they are no more fit to be there than Satan and his angels. This is just as Satan would have it. Powerful statement. You know, you've heard what's happened, what's been happening in the Christian world. You know, they, they feel like they need to impose the law of God. They need to have it as monuments in front of courthouses because they see that things are slipping away. But listen, folks, lives are not changed by posting the Ten Commandments in a court of law. Lives are changed by implanting the holy law of God in the heart of the human being to overcome the sinful desires in the heart. You see, people want to be called Christians, but they want to continue living their worldly lifestyle. And the Apostle Paul says, Timothy, the time is coming when they're not going to endure sound teaching. They're going to pile up teachers that, that will teach them that they can live in their, with their sinful desires. Now, I want you to notice an interesting expression that the Apostle Paul uses. He says, because they have what? Itching ears. Now, what does that mean, they have itching ears? Basically, what the Apostle Paul says is they're going to pile up teachers that will tell them what they want to hear. They will pile up teachers that will tickle their ear, if you please. Or as the NIV expresses it, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. We hear a lot in the world today and even in the church, about meeting people's felt needs. But I fear that many times these felt needs are not really needs, they are felt wants. Let me illustrate what I mean. Let's suppose you have an itch. What do you think your most immediate need is? To scratch, absolutely. Your most immediate need is to scratch. But is it perhaps the case that this might not be your most immediate need, but your most immediate want? Let's suppose that that itch that you have, that you satisfy by scratching it, is skin cancer. Would you say that your most immediate need would be scratching it? Absolutely not. What would your most immediate need be? It would be to go to the doctor to get the real problem what? To get the real problem fixed. 
You see, many times we just want to supply our immediate need, and it's really not a need, it is a what? It is a want. And we don't want to supply what we really need, but what we really want. You know, in Jeremiah's day, the same thing was happening. Jeremiah 5.31, we're told the prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their own means, and my people love to have it so. You know, I'm not much on the, uh, up on the Living Bible, but uh, sometimes I read a paraphrase to see if it catches the sense of the text. I like the Living Bible in verse 3. This is what it says. For there is going to come a time when people won't listen to the truth, but will go around looking for teachers who will tell them just what they want to hear. Are you catching what the Apostle Paul is saying here? Let's notice again. The Apostle Paul says, I charge you under oath. This is under oath that I'm saying this. Before God and before Jesus Christ, who is going to judge me if I don't say it under oath, he says, preach the word. By the way, in context, that's the written scriptures, the holy inspired written scriptures. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. In other words, be ready to preach any time, any place. Convince, rebuke, exhort with great patience and by teaching as a method. Now why? He says, for the time will come when they will not endure, they will not tolerate sound doctrine. Now the doctrine is spoken of as content, not as the method of teaching, but content. People will not put up with sound doctrine as doctrine itself. But according to their own desires, their own lusts, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. Basically, teachers who will teach them what they want to hear. And now I want you to notice what the end result of this is. We're told at the end of this passage, and they will turn their ears away from the truth. Who does the turning here? The same ones who heaped up teachers, right? This is their action. As a result of piling up teachers that will teach them what they want to hear, what will they do? They'll not only listen to what they want to hear, but they will turn away their ears from hearing the truth. But now I want you to notice a very interesting nuance here in the text. It says they will turn their ears away from the truth, and now notice, and be turned aside to fables. That's an important expression, be turned aside. Notice that this is not their action. This is someone else's action because it's passive. They will be turned. They're not doing it. Somebody else is doing it to them. In other words, they will turn their ears away from the truth, and as a result, someone will turn them to fables. They will be turned to fables. Now you say, what are you talking about? The fact is, folks, that when we turn away our ear from the truth, we are allowing free reign for Satan to come in and delude us, for Satan to come in and deceive us. That's what this passage is talking about. In fact, they will become victims of Satan because they have chosen to pile up teachers who will teach them what they want to hear. They turn away their ears from the truth, and as a result, they're at the mercy of Satan. They will be turned aside to fables. Makes me think of that parallel passage in 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 to 13, which we studied a few weeks ago, speaking about the lawless one. It says, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Now, why do they perish? Notice, because they did not receive what? The love of the truth that they might be saved. So because they did not receive the, the, the love of the truth, what is going to happen? It says, and for this reason, God will send them what? 
Strong delusion. God doesn't do it. It was their choice. They turned away their ear from the truth. They didn't want the love of the truth. So God says, okay, you don't want the love of the truth. You want uh, to hear what you want to hear, and you pile up teachers that will tell you what you want to hear. That's fine. You turn away your ears from the truth, and now who steps in? Satan does. In fact, it says in verse 11, and for this reason God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You know, we live in a postmodern world where people don't want to know anything about truth, absolute truth. In fact, even in the church we hear people saying, don't talk to me about doctrine or don't talk to me about truth. What we need is a personal relationship with Jesus. I agree we need a personal relationship with Jesus. But that personal relationship with Jesus cannot be a genuine personal relationship with Jesus unless we have the doctrine right. Let me give you an example of what I mean. A state of the dead doctrine. You know, I've often wondered how Ellen White could say that the devil is going to deceive many Seventh-day Adventists to think that those who are appearing to them are really departed relatives when they really are the spirits of devils? I mean, as Adventists, we say, we know that the Bible says that the living know that they will die, the dead know nothing. I'll never be deceived because the Bible is so clear. How in the, how in the world could a Seventh-day Adventist be deceived on such a fundamental doctrine as this? I believe there's four ways. Number one, Satan will saturate the media with films which relentlessly teach the reality of life after death. Is he doing that? Do you know people actually come to believe what they watch even if they say, oh, this is fiction, this is fiction, this is fiction? No, eventually you come to believe it. I've had church members come and ask me, for example, about the Da Vinci Code. Hello, Pastor Boer, how much truth is there in this book? None. Oh, the Gospel of Judas, new revelation about Judas. What? Are we studying our Bibles? Do we really know what the Bible teaches about Mary Magdalene? You know, I was mentioning in my class this morning, I bet you if I did a survey here of those who are present, on where that text is found, unto 2300 days and the sanctuary will be cleansed, you wouldn't be able to tell me book, chapter, and verse. And that's the fundamental verse that makes the Seventh-day Adventist Church what it is. So I believe the devil is going to use the media, and he is using the media, to just bombard you with the idea that the dead really are dead. Secondly, he's going to use apparitions. The Spirit of Prophecy tells us this. Undeniable appearances of individuals who look just like our relatives. Same voice. Third, she says that these individuals are going to perform miracles. Undeniable miracles in our sight. And fourth, she seems to imply that these entities are actually going to use Bible verses because they're going to know that we are going to say, ah, wait a minute. The Bible says that the dead don't know anything. And so they're going to have verses saying maybe your belief wasn't right. And they're, they're going to say, what about the rich man in Lazarus? What about the witch of Endor? What about the thief on the cross? What about Paul's desire to depart? What about absent from the body and present with the Lord? What about Jesus preaching to the spirits in prison? Folks, if we don't have those ideas clear in our minds, settled in our minds, we'll be fodder for apostatizing from the faith. Notice what Ellen White has to say about this powerful delusion. Great Controversy, page 552. She says, he has, that is the devil, has power to bring before men the appearance of their departed friends. The counterfeit is perfect. Do you know what a perfect counterfeit is, folks? It's where the federal government can't tell the difference between a genuine $100 bill and a false or a counterfeit $100 bill. She says, the counterfeit is perfect. The familiar look, the words, the tone are reproduced with marvelous distinctness. Many are comforted with the assurance that their loved ones are enjoying the bliss of heaven. And without suspicion of danger, they give ear to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Great Controversy, page 552. Page 593, she says, this Antichrist is to perform his marvelous works in our sight. 
So closely will the counterfeit resemble the true that it will be impossible to distinguish between them except by the Holy Scriptures. By their testimony, every statement and every miracle must be tested. But how can we test it with the Word if we don't know the Word? You know, Jesus knew how to answer the devil. It is written because he knew where it was written. I fear that with many Adventists these days, we can't answer it is written because we don't know where it's written. And perhaps, I go a step further, we can't answer the devil it is written because we don't even know if it's written. The fact is that Adventists need to be the people of the book again. We need to sit down and struggle with the great themes of Holy Scripture. We need to settle them in our minds. We need to understand them. We need to be able to explain them. Great Controversy 625, Ellen White says, Only those who have been diligent students of the Scriptures and who have received the love of the truth will be shielded from the powerful delusion that takes the world captive. By the Bible testimony, these will detect the deceiver in his disguise. To all, the testing time will come. By the sifting of temptation, the genuine Christian will be revealed. And now notice this. Are the people of God now so firmly established upon his word that they would not yield to the evidence of their senses? Would they, in such a crisis, cling to the Bible and the Bible only? One final statement from Ellen White on this doctrine of the state of the dead. Early writings, page 87, she says, Satan will have power to bring before us that's Adventist, the appearance of forms purporting to be our relatives or friends now sleeping in Jesus. It will be made to appear as if these friends were present. The words that they uttered while here, with which we were familiar, will be spoken, and the same tone of voice that they had while living will fall upon the ear. All this is to deceive the saints not the world, to deceive the saints and ensnare them in the belief of this delusion. And then she gives us the antidote. She says, I saw that the saints must get a thorough understanding of present truth, which they will be obliged to maintain from the Scriptures. They must understand the state of the dead. What must we understand? Have you ever sat down to struggle with the passage about the rich man and Lazarus? Do you know how to explain that? Is it clear in your mind? Do you know how to explain absent from the body and present with the Lord? Do we know how to explain the past passage that says that Jesus went to preach to the spirits in prison? Well, if we're not persuaded, if we don't understand these, if we have any doubt, the devil can take advantage of that doubt. She says they must understand the state of the dead, for the spirits of devils will yet appear to them, professing to be beloved friends and relatives who will declare to them that the Sabbath has been changed, also other unscriptural doctrines. They will do all in their power to excite sympathy and will work miracles before them to confirm what they declare. The people of God must be prepared to withstand these spirits with the Bible truth that the dead know not anything and that they who appear to them are the spirits of devils. You know, I believe that we need to study, study Scripture to feed our hearts. I believe that. But I believe that we also need to study Scripture to feed and strengthen our minds. It's not enough to just study the Bible devotionally. We must struggle, according to Ellen White, with the great themes of Scripture. Bible study must feed the heart and it must feed the mind. It must be analyzed with unimpassioned reason. And it also must, must touch our affections. It must reach the left brain and it must reach the right brain as well. But sometimes we're so caught up in the relationship aspect, in the feeling aspect, in the devotional aspect, that we don't, don't really sit down and struggle with the great, complex, 
problematic issues that we find in Scripture to give a reason for the faith that is found in us. Now, folks, a few years ago, a great preacher by the name of Norman Vincent Peale. You know who he was? The power of positive thinking. Do you remember? His biggest disciple in the world today is Robert Schuller from the Crystal Cathedral down in Orange County in Southern California. Do you know that Norman Vincent Peale, this uh, Presbyterian preacher, claims to have seen his dead father singing in the church choir? Hmm. It says he looked and he saw his, his dead father singing in the church choir. And he claims that one day in his, in his study, his mother came and tapped him on the shoulder. Now when he was asked, how did he know it was his father and his mother? Listen to the reasons he gave. He says, first of all, I saw him with my own eyes. Secondly, he said, instinct whispers that death is not the end. Third, he says, reason confirms it. Fourth, he says, psychic, psychic phenomena even support it. And finally, he said, even science insists that the universe is more spiritual than material. In his answer, not once did he ever quote scripture. Now, if that's happening outside the Adventist church, Could it happen within the Seventh-day Adventist Church? You see, folks, we need an external, trustworthy standard outside of ourselves to evaluate everything. We can't trust impressions, intuitions, feelings, emotions, miracles, science, preachers, voices. None of that is trustworthy. We can only trust fully and completely the Holy Word of God. But to trust the Word of God, we must know it. And in order to know it, we must study it. So, when the preacher gets up and preach, preaches a strong message, don't storm the preacher. You know, we need to take it to heart. We need to sit down, well, maybe what he's saying is, is right. Maybe, maybe there needs to be a change in my life. And may, perhaps it would help if I, if I sat down and studied this in a fuller way. You know, when I get up and preach, it's, sometimes it sounds like I'm scolding the church. Well, you know, I preach to myself every time I preach. Because I'm in the same boat. But I want you to know that I have a passion for these things because I believe that we're living in the last moments of time. And the Spirit of Prophecy tells us that, that the majority of those who are in the church are going to forsake us. It says multitudes are going to leave. Like the blowing leaves of autumn. That's sad. That's tragic. It never has to happen that way. You see, folks, we need to take the Word of God and we need to make it a part of our lives. We need to dedicate time to the study of God's Holy Word. Set aside all those things that consume our time and get down to business and study that which will truly feed our soul, that will truly feel, feed our mind. You know, you can go to a grocery store and you can see all these wonderful products on the shelf. Do you know that those products on the shelf are not going to do you any good? Right? Oh, I love to go to grocery stores. You know, look at all the good food. You know what? None of that will do you any good unless you take the food home, you prepare it, you put it in your mouth, you chew it, you swallow it, and you digest it. Now, this book on a shelf is just like food in a grocery store. Oh, yeah, there's lots of good food in here. But unless we're opening it, unless we're chewing it, unless we're swallowing it, unless we're digesting it, it is doing absolutely no good to us. In other words, what I'm saying, folks, is that we need to take the Bible, we need to place the Bible inside. And by the way, we eat through our mouth physically. We eat through our eyes and our ears spiritually. 
I'd like to read a text which I've read many times before. It's so beautiful that it bears reading again. Psalm 119, 9 through 11. You know, we talk a lot about the crisis among our youth and everything. You know, the devil has wanted to steal the youth. And do you know how his most successful method has been inventing all kinds of distractions? So if they're not in the Word and they're not in prayer, they're not in church, church is boring, because the church can't compete with the exciting things that you see on television with video games. We, we can't compete. What is the real secret for having a youth which is alive, which is thriving? Psalm 119, verses 9 through 11. Psalm 119, verses 9 through 11. Here David is speaking particularly to the youth, and he says, How can a young man cleanse his way? What's the answer? By taking heed according to your word. Then he says, With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. And here comes the key portion of the passage. Your word... I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. How about it, folks? How about getting down to business and filling our minds and hearts with God's Word? only a 60-second TV spot, but it scored. The scene, a typical American family rushing to prepare breakfast. The phone rings. Sis grabs the receiver and dashes across the kitchen as she talks. Junior piles the toast high and heads for the table. Crash! He stumbles over the phone cord. Mom appears just in time to see toast flying in all directions. She delivers an ultimatum. The next one to spill anything is going to get a smack. Waving her arms for emphasis, she bangs into the glass of juice held by little brother. Juice splashes all over the floor. Dad comes forward to administer the punishment. Well, honey, it looks like you deserve a smack. He raises his hand and grabs his wife and gives her a much-needed hug and kiss. Surely, someone in your family could use a hug and kiss today. Think about Matthew 7, 12. Do for others what you want them to do for you. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Broadcasting the Gospel 24 hours.